Welcome to the Beyond Sunday podcast, where we bring Sunday home. Join us as we dive deeper into First Baptist's weekly sermons, discuss practical applications, and answer your questions. Hello and welcome to the Beyond Sunday podcast. I'm Jordan Upton, and with me as always is Pastor Jeff Reynolds. Jeff, how are you doing today? Jordan, we continue to pray for Israel. We continue to pray for everything that's going on over there. And um, as we um, head toward Thanksgiving and we head toward um, the Advent season, we remember that salvation emerges from the Jewish people, our Jewish Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, And so I I just want to say out loud, we absolutely renounce any form of anti-Semitism and that is ungodly in every regard. And of course, we pray for all people, all people for sure. Um, but this, this, this specific anti-Semitic hatred that has emerged in some pockets of society uh, is just deplorable in every way. And so uh, continue to pray with us for everything. I'm wearing my necklace. I told many of you, uh, I guess it's a chain when it's a boy wearing it. I don't normally wear one, so I don't know exactly what to call it, but I've got my Jerusalem cross that uh, mm-hmm. since I'm not used to wearing it every time I feel it, and I feel it a lot, it's a, it's a wonderful reminder to pray, uh, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And uh, Jordan, I want to thank you for putting together the wonderful prayer event that we had on Wednesday night. Had a wonderful crowd of many people from different churches who came, and uh, even the one of the local messianic congregations came, and uh, the pastor there, uh, who I'm who whom I have known for many many years, and uh, just a great deal of respect um, for him and for Hope and Messiah Congregation and your family. You had many family members here, and um, so what a wonderful event! Thank you for putting that together. Yeah, thank you for wanting to make it happen. I mean, we, you know, you and I were talking about it and we wanted to make sure that we we did something in this moment, you know? Like we we do have an important calling as Christians to stand with Israel. Yeah. It's not just, you know, it's not just it's not some sort of political thing. No, not this, at all. This is this is a our Bible is made up of an Old Testament and a New Testament. And God uh, chose Father Abraham, and Father Abraham has many sons, and we Gentiles have been grafted in through Jesus Christ our Lord. And, um, and of course, we, we pray for the salvation of all people in recognizing Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, as God's Messiah, and the way by which we all come to the Father. But um, we have an obligation as, as followers of Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, um, uh, to pray for Israel and to stand with Israel. And so um, thanks for keeping that before us. I'm glad we could do it. It was a really blessed event, and we just continue to pray for Israel. Now, on a, on a much lighter note, we're excited. We're really excited about this coming week's episode of the Beyond Sunday podcast. It's going to be a little different, and it's going to be really neat. So tell us tell us what we've got coming. You're the one that, you are the mastermind of all this stuff. So tell us what's coming up. Absolutely. Well, this is something we have wanted to do for a long time. We're going to sit down with Lauren Parrish and with TJ Renfro, our ministers of children and our minister of youth. And we're going to talk about just raising kids. And we're going to talk about what's coming up here at First Baptist and opportunities to really grow as families here in yeah. the church and in the uh, Christianity in general. Yeah, Lauren and TJ have been wonderful additions to our staff, and we are so thankful to have both of them here. Um, they bring fresh perspective and fresh energy, and you know we're coming off of a phenomenally successful trunk or treat event. Now, it did have to move inside because of the rain, but it worked out really well. Uh, TJ's coming off of a phenomenally successful student fall retreat, and uh, we got to see some scenes from that in worship. Chad Walden, who is our director of broadcast and media outreach, put together a great video of that. And in fact, this coming Sunday, we will see a great video that he'll put together from Trunk or Treat. Because again, a picture is worth a thousand words and a moving picture is worth even more. So um, just God is doing some wonderful things in the lives of children and students and families in First Baptist Church right now. And we're really excited to get to hear from TJ and Lauren as they lead us in those areas. They're doing a great job. They really are. Yeah, I'm really excited about that episode. And I'm really excited about today's topic. So we're, we're talking about Philip. Yes. So the passage from this weekend was John 1, 43 through 46. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, 
follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Mm. Okay, so Jeff, there's just so many things we could talk about from Sunday. Uh, I, I want to truncate a couple of them here at the beginning, just some rapid fire questions. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, Nathaniel says that nothing good can come from Nazareth. I mean, we know what it means, but like, what does he mean? What is he talking about? Uh, yeah. Well, first of all, frankly, if you've ever been to Nazareth, and now I have, it's not the best place to go. I mean, it just <laughs> is what it is. I, you know, it's it's... It's dirty and smelly, and when you come in and and you, your bus drops you off, you go to the Church of the Annunciation, which is beautiful, and and it's the home they believe of. This is where the angel Gabriel came to Mary, hmm. and uh, and so they have built a beautiful multi level church around this, and you can actually go down into the grotto and see the home, and uh, and so it's phenomenal. And then next door is, you know, the church for Joseph, you know, and it's not as nice, but you know, we dads, we understand, you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, Joseph's just incidental to the story here. And so, um, no, I'm, I'm kidding, but it, yeah, yeah, it yeah. is funny. There's a statue of Joseph in one of the, one of the traditions, um, he's sitting and the knees of the statue are rubbed. Like it's a bronze statue, but it's, it's, tarnished over the years, uh-huh. but the knees uh, are bright because one of the traditions is people come by and they rub the knees of Joseph before they go up to Joseph's church. So that has nothing to do with Philip, but it has everything to do with the fact that you're in Nazareth and it's, you know, uh, we left Nazareth. And I'm like, Lord, your hometown. I mean, I get where Nathaniel's coming from now. I mean, you know, not to be ugly about it, but it just it wasn't like this grand scene that I was we're going to Nazareth and uh, but um, so anyway yeah and, and quite frankly you know you may have a place where you consider it a good place to be from meaning it's it's a place you were able to get out of I don't know um, I don't have any places like that because I love all places and all people but um, yeah so that's that's where he's coming from yeah thank you okay second rapid fire. So you only reference passages about Philip from the Gospel of John, yep. but in Acts 8, there are several stories about a believer named Philip. Now, is this the same Philip, or is this a different Philip? That is a great question, and if you Google it, you're going to find that some people say it's the same guy, and some people say it's a different guy. I think it's a different guy. So yep. you have Philip, who is the apostle, one of the twelve, and then Philip, who is chosen as the the one of the first deacons so in acts chapter six when they choose the the deacons to serve the tables to wait on the tables make sure the widows are are getting what they need uh the word deacon simply means servant so um that philip who is philip the deacon uh is known as philip the evangelist uh because he's the one who shares with the ethiopian eunuch in acts chapter eight uh this phenomenal story of isaiah 53 and i could totally just go on a tangent about that right now but um there are some folks, some scholars, some even denominations who believe it's the same guy. Uh, I don't. I I think that uh, it's two distinct people, uh, both with a Greek name, Philip, but there there are actually four Philips in the in the New Testament. Um, But yeah, I think it's a different guy. That's why I didn't reference anything from Acts. And and in preparing for the message, I went back (laughs) and and consulted several sources and uh, trustworthy sources that were like, yeah, it's two different guys. So I just just wanted to ensure that because quite frankly, if it were the same guy, I would have spent half the time in Acts. Mm -hmm. I mean, because, you know, the stories of of Philip the evangelist and the work done by Philip, um, they're phenomenal stories, but... It's two different guys. Yeah, that's interesting. I, you know, I, I read something the other day about James, the brother of Jesus. Yes, and I believe it was Eusebius. I don't, I don't want to put shade on Eusebius, but I, <laughs> I, I think he conflated James, the brother of Jesus, with one of the twelve. Yes. Um. So it, it's just one of those things in the church fathers. You're, you know, you find that that there's this confusion early on because people have similar names. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes after the fact, we, we kind of go back and we're like, you know, those probably are actually two different people. 
Well, that, yeah, that was a problem back then, uh, just as it's a problem now. I mean, you know, think of a popular name today and how many of those you know. And uh, there were a lot of Jameses, there were a lot of Josephs, there were even a lot of Jesuses. Jesus is a form of Joshua. And so, you, I mean, so there is some degree of disambiguation that is necessary. And, you know, the church fathers were wonderful men, but they were not infallible. They could make mistakes, mm-hmm. and they did. Um, so that's why we don't have, you know, those early books as part of the Bible. And now they're, they're trustworthy, but they're not the Word of God. And so they are very possibly, uh, or they are very able to be in error. And so trustworthy, but not perfect. How's that? That's great. Yeah, that's insightful. Okay, so I really want to sit and pause on uh, this question here for a bit. So during your sermon, you talked about two different ways that someone could reject the gospel. So the first way being that they have no information about God, so they you know, therefore can't accept it. Yeah. And then two, they have misinformation about God, so they reject it, God. Uh, but how do we interact with people who understand the gospel, but then still reject it? You know, so I'm going to tell you the scariest passage in the Bible for me is in Matthew chapter 7. And it is part of the Sermon on the Mount, and it is Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And I think the greatest tragedy, while people who who are lost and, and die and enter into a Christless eternity, that is a profound tragedy. People who are deceived, thinking they're in, uh, but they are not. That to me is an even greater tragedy. That is uh, that is the work of Satan in in, in deceiving and and pulling people away from the truth of who God is and and compelling people to worship uh, a counterfeit. And uh, it is um, man, it, it, it's disgusting to me. And so I wanted to make it very clear. Now, there are various levels of having misinformation about God. You know, there's, there's, you know, I talked about grandmas who say that thunder is angels bowling, mm-hmm. and 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 I think that that's an important clarification to make because even when we tell people that, I can tell you talking to them when they're in their twenties or maybe they're going through a college class and they're dealing with not only an atheist professor but an anti-theist professor. Um, you know that that line of reasoning that the atheist professor is going to use is, you know, it's all fairy tales. And for years, you believe that the thunder was the angels bowling, but it's the sound of lightning. And so, you know, um, so there can be very, I call it very innocent misinformation about God. That's just not helpful. Yep. You know, uh, even the whole thing, this is the church, this is the steeple, open it up and there are other people. Yep. You know, that's a misdefinition of what church is. Church is not a building with a steeple. We don't have a steeple, so it doesn't have to have a steeple. But it, the, the church is the people. And, and so the New Testament definition of the church is not the facility, it's the people. Um, so, that, you know, I, I just personally find it helpful to be clear in teaching things about God and, and what he teaches us in the Word of God. Um, but then on, on more malicious levels— um, you know, they're, they're false prophets to this day, false teachers. Um, you know, TV preachers have a bad name, and I say this as a TV preacher, but they have a bad name for a good reason, because many of them are charlatans who are able to entertain and who are able to sell a product. I, I mean, I will just tell you, the, the whole health, wealth, prosperity gospel, I believe is straight out of the pits of hell. There is no New Testament believer that you could convince that just because you have a relationship with Jesus, that you will never get sick again, that you will never be poor, <laughs> materially poor again, that you will never face any sort of struggle again. Because if you go back to the New Testament and look at the lives of believers, every one of them faced struggle. Now, they had different levels of material wealth and things of that nature. They had different levels of sickness. But if you look at the apostles, you know, historically, 
Tradition teaches us, and again, this is not the Word of God, but this is leaning on those historians that we believe are trustworthy, although not infallible. Mm -hmm. We believe that all but one of the apostles, John, um, were martyred for their faith. And so, you know, go tell a martyr that if you give your life to Jesus, you will never struggle again. It's it's laughable. Um, It's... Um, so I think I think that the prosperity gospel, um, which has spread like wildfire around the world, because it sells, mm-hmm. it sells. Oh, you have problems. Oh, you don't have enough money at the end of the month. Oh, you you know you're facing a sickness or whatever. Well, just give your life to Jesus, and all that will go away. And I can say as a pastor who over the years has met with a lot of people who fell for it, but then realized that it that it isn't real uh, because the problem didn't go away the illness remained the you know the 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 financial birth it doesn't mean that god can't provide financial blessing it doesn't mean that god can't provide healing blessing i pray for healing every single day in people's lives i'm praying for healing right now i just got done texting with a with a, a gentleman whose mother is is very very sick and we are praying and asking god to intervene and heal that doesn't mean that but i'm telling you this notion that, and then the, the the folks that are asking you to send in your seed faith offering, you know, send in your seed faith offering and God will bless you. Well, good night. That is nothing but an indulgence pre- repackaged for the 21st century. You pay me enough money, God will hear your prayer. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you something. On the day of judgment, with people who are who are selling that garbage, if they come up before you, I'd back up. Because I believe that God um, is is not going to deal kindly with people who have sought to make a dollar by uh, falsifying the message of hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And so, so I, I bring that up to say, you know, there are plenty of people who don't know anything about. God. They've never heard of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. They've never heard the name Jesus. They've never seen a Bible in their language uh, or a Bible at all. And we want to reach those folks. And we have Bible translators who are working to get the Bible into the heart language of every tribe, tongue, and nation. But the but the work is, is there's much to be done. Um, when people are misinformed, um, you know, you just have to appeal to the truth. And, and, and in my experience, you appeal to authority. And the authority is the Word of God. God has given us His Word so that we might know Him. And the canon is sealed. He has given us what we need, everything we need for life and godliness. We don't have every answer to everything, but we have everything we need for life and godliness. And, uh, and to just return to truth. Now, if they reject the notion that the Bible is the Word of God, then then that calls into question everything that's in all 66 books. Um, And so that's a little bit more difficult. So then we have to go to, okay, how can we know that the Bible is the Word of God? Well, you look at manuscript evidence and you look at all, you know, there's all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would recommend uh, Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ as he tells his story. You can even watch the movie The Case for Christ and see how Lee Strobel went from being an atheist to a believer. Or Josh McDowell, who went from being an atheist to a believer, reading More Than a Carpenter or reading Evidence That Demands a Verdict. You know, those are classic works that will help you understand why the Bible can be considered trustworthy and true, um, but we have to just appeal to truth. So if I'm talking to somebody who says, yes, I believe the Bible, but I don't believe X, Y, or Z that the Bible teaches, well, then the question becomes why. This is what God says. Tell me why. And we work through it. And, you know, they'll say, well, I don't like what God says. And I can say, well, I don't always like what God says either. Because what God does through his word and by his spirit is he refines us as in a fire. He doesn't say he refines us as in eating cotton candy. (laughs) I mean, you know, he's got to remove the dross. And that's, that's not an easy process. And it's an offensive process. I heard somebody say one time, you know, the truth will set you free. And indeed it will. Jesus said that himself but it will make you mad first. And that's true. Um, so when we're confronted with truth in the, in the Word of God, you know, just because it makes us mad doesn't make it not true. Just because it's offensive to us doesn't make it not true. The notion that I am a sinner separated from God is 
deeply offensive to me, but I have to embrace that truth so that I will flee to Christ and find salvation for my my life and and my eternity. So um, that's that's kind of how I, I went a long way. I gave you a lot of words and the right. answer to that question, but but that's kind of where all that came from. You know, I. Philip's not the only one who embraced some misinformation about God, but as we looked at those scenes, you know, Jesus tests him by saying, how are we going to feed all these people? You know, well, Philip's embracing some misinformation, but, you know, Jesus, we're going to have to find money to find bread to find, you know, all the, and Jesus is like, I'm the bread of life, dude, watch this. Um, or Philip saying, just show us the Father and that's enough. You know, what is he embracing? He's embracing misinformation about who Jesus is. And so Jesus is clarifying to him, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. So so I thought, you know, Philip wasn't the only disciple who embraced misinformation about God, but those vignettes that we have of his life allow us to really address that issue. And, and so the, my introduction is always the last part of the sermon that I prepare, always, mm-hmm. thousand percent of the time. And, uh, and so just looking back over the, the points and looking back over the stories, it was just like, you know, this is a great time to talk about this issue. Mm-hmm. So, but that's how, that's how I go about dealing with people um, who have embraced misinformation is just say, okay, what's your, what's your authority? And is your authority trustworthy and true? Um, incidentally, that's also why I so encourage people to read the Bible. You know, how do you say I so firmly believe something I've never read? I mean, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and it doesn't mean, you know, my kids are believers. They haven't made it all the way through the Bible yet. Um, but, man, when we read God's Word, it's eye-opening. It's enlightening. Um, in some points, it's, it's, you know, it steps on our toes, and, uh, but it, it calls us to growth. So. You touched on a really important apologetic point there. It, it, if someone's approaching you with something and presenting you with a difficulty, ask where their information is coming from, what source they're using. I yeah. mean, there, there are scholars that say that you know Judas was the chief disciple of Jesus. Yeah, he was the hero. Yeah, exactly. Because he's the one that made the cross happen. So right. he's the hero, and that's based out of the gospel of Judas, quote-unquote. Right. You can't see my air quotes. But that's one of the Gnostic Gospels that came from the 3rd and 4th century that, you know. um, So again, we just go back to what is the authority? What is the truth? And, and, you know, another thing that that is helpful is is recognizing that there's a reason people say what they say, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, absolutely. And and even saying, you know, you know, Jordan, I I can tell that, that, you know, there was a reason you said that. And, and what I've found is that's disarming to say, okay, you're not calling me an unreasonable person. You're not saying I'm an ignorant person at face value. You're saying I'm a human being with a mind and intellect, and and there's a reason for what I just said. So let's talk about what is the reason for what I just said. And it may be, well, somebody I love when I was a kid said this, and I've just held on to it. Well, there's a lot of people I loved as a kid who said a lot of things that turned out not to be true. Um, so, you know, again, just conversing as reasonable human beings. Uh, the Bible compels us to reason together. And so we do. And, um, yeah, that seems to be a helpful technique. Yeah, absolutely. And this takes us really nicely into today's practical application question. So, Jeff, you said on Sunday that the way to overcome misinformation is to be open to the Word. Yeah. So, what's the difference between a heart that is open to the Word and a heart that's too open to suggestion? Man, that is such a great question. And, and you know, the Bible addresses this. In Ephesians chapter 4, um, the Bible talks about the fact that our call is to become mature in Christ. Mm -hmm. And so in Ephesians chapter four, Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus saying in beginning in verse 11, and he, God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Listen to this verse 14 so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, 
Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So the key is maturing in Christ. And the way that we mature in Christ is we get in the Word. Uh, and we get in prayer, and we get around people who push us to the Word and to prayer. And again, I'll go back to, if I don't know what the Bible says for myself, then all I can do is listen to what you tell me the Bible says. That's dangerous. And I believe that we have functionally, in so many ways, returned to a pre-printing press sort of a time. You know, before the printing press was invented, most people were not literate, and and people had to just trust what the leaders told them. And so the reason the Protestant Reformation happened is because the printing press was invented, and people were able to read the Bible for themselves. They did not have to rely on what somebody else said about God or what somebody else said about the Bible. Well, we have more Bibles in print today than ever in the history of ever. (laughs) And functionally, unfortunately, in the Western world, we are as biblically illiterate as they were in pre-printing press days because we don't read it. Mm -hmm. And if I don't read the Word of God, then all I can do is trust what you tell me about it. And so I think that, that the key there to grow in maturity is to read the Word. Um... And there are so many ways that you can access it. You know, um, I've said before on this podcast, the way that I do the Bible reading every day is by listening to it because I am more of an auditory learner and I am actually able to focus more clearly on what I'm hearing than what I'm reading. The way my brain works when I'm reading, I get distracted like mm-hmm. crazy. Mm-hmm. But when I'm listening, it processes. That's the way I used to study for tests. You know, if I want to do a good job on a test, I need to talk to you about the material. I don't need to just look at note cards. If I converse with you, I got it, mm-hmm. you know? So you, you got to find the way that works for you. Some people get their pen out and they're underlining and they're making notes and all that. Uh, I make notes by way of dictating them into my phone through the Uversion app. So there are so many ways to access the Word of God. In fact, I, I was with some folks at Judson University last week, learned about a new technology called the Filament Bible. And in the Filament Bible, every single page has a little QR code by the page number. And you can scan that code with your phone. And if you have the Filament app on your phone, which is free, it will bring up notes and uh, maps <laughs> and information, wow. even worship songs. I mean, it's so cool. I've already shared it with TJ and Lauren, and we're going to look at seeing if we can access some filament Bibles in the ESV version because the team that's putting that together, I got to talk with the team that's putting this together at Judson University. It's just unbelievable because the goal is to make Bible engagement an experience that Generation Z and Generation A um, can access not only for themselves, but within community with their peers and their friends. And so um, got to get in the Word. Because if you're not in the Word, all you can do is trust what somebody else says. And, and they may be intentionally trying to deceive you, or they may be unwittingly deceiving you. And so that's that's the answer. Mm-hmm. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. I've heard that somewhere. Yeah. First John 4, 1. That's where. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jeff, this has been incredibly enlightening. Uh, May we all continue to grow to maturity in Christ and unity in the faith. Listeners, if you have questions that you want us to address on the show, please, please go to the link in the show notes or comment on the post below, and we'll we'll try to answer them here on the show. And, And tune in next week. We're really excited to have Lauren and TJ on. Jeff, can you pray us out for today? Let's pray. Lord, you are the God of truth. Everything you are and everything you say is true. And... Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Help us to walk in the light of your truth. Help us to see deception for what it is and to flee from it. And help us, Lord, to help others do the same. To speak the truth in love. And, Lord, to be built up and to help build others up to full maturity in Jesus Christ our Lord. It's in his precious and holy name that we pray. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to our channel. To submit a question about Sunday's sermon, the Bible, or walking with Jesus, click the link in the episode description. Our hosts today are Pastor Jeff Reynolds and myself, Jordan Upton. Our engineer is Elliot Beckley, and our editors are Chadwick Walden and Fu Ying Engdahl.